Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the webinar today, Contract Terminations. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first things first, we're lawyers, so of course we have to start with the fine print. Uh, we just put this slide here just so that everybody is clear at the outset that we're not providing individual legal advice today. This webinar is intended for informational purposes, but of course we're happy to talk with you about any specific issues you have uh, offline. My name is John Williams, and I'm joined today by Michelle Lidekin. We're uh, two lawyers in the Government Contracts Group at Palero Mazza. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who may not know Palero Mazza, we're a law firm in Washington, D.C. Our primary practice groups are government contracting, a, a labor and employment, corporate and mergers and acquisitions, and litigation. Uh, if you found your way to this webinar, you may already be signed up for our newsletters and blogs and other uh, information that we put out, but if um, if you're not signed up, I encourage you to check us out in the various ways that you can find us online. Uh, we got one note uh, that somebody's having a hard time seeing the slides. I just want to make sure if, if uh, we could have anybody else please chime in if you're not seeing the slides. We're now we've now scrolled through to the overview slide. Um, and so assuming everybody's able to follow along, here, now we're seeing the overview of what we're, what we're going to do with the presentation today. This is the second of a two-part webinar series that we've done this summer on contract claims. Uh, and the last webinar, which we did back in July, covered requests for equitable adjustment and claims. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to do that webinar, I encourage you to check it out. We have a link coming up later in these slides um, so that if you click that link, it'll take you right to the, the past webinar. It's also available on the presentations page of our website, poleromazza.com, and on our YouTube channel. So, so that one dealt with... Um, uh, Request for equitable adjustment and claims, and now we're dealing with contract termination. So we're going to dive into terminations for convenience and terminations for default, what we're going to refer to as T for C and T for D. Uh, and after we get into the nitty-gritty of both of those, we'll sum it up with a, with a quick at-a-glance comparison of T for C and T for D. And then we're going to give you a brief overview of termination appeals, and we'll talk about a few recent cases in, uh, involving terminations. And then we'll end it with questions and answers. We'll, we'll do our best to end maybe five, ten minutes prior to 2 p.m. so we can take your questions and answer as many as we can during the webinar. For those questions that we can't get to, we will email each of you afterwards uh, to make sure that you get your question answered. So please don't hold back. Fire away. We'll answer as many as we can as we move through, and, and we'll try to save some time at the end as well. Um, and, and just on the, the administrative issue of the slides, I got a few responses. Thank you for, from folks saying that they can see the slides and a few responses from people who are not seeing the slides. So uh, I, I, I suspect that means there might be a technical issue on the, for the folks that aren't seeing the slides, since we do have people who are seeing them. I apologize for that. Uh, for those who cannot see the slides, if you want to hang in and listen, uh, please do. And uh, the slides are available in a few uh, ways right now. You could go to our website, poleromaza.com, on the presentations page, and you can download the slides there. The slides are also posted in PDF format right in this webinar in the, in the handouts section of the dashboard. So you could follow along manually if you pull the slides down those ways. And then we're going to send the slides to everybody once this presentation is over. So uh, again, sorry if you're not able to see them now. Uh, but we will make sure you get them. So now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to talk about T for C, termination for convenience. 
Good afternoon. Uh, so you've probably seen T4C provisions in your uh, government contracts. A T4C allows the government to cancel a contract uh, in whole or in part whenever the contracting officer determines uh, the determination is in the government's interest. So that's very broad uh, ability to terminate. A T4C provision is required for most contracts with the federal government. And prime contractors are encouraged to include a T4C provision in their subcontracts. In most cases, when a contract is T4C, the government will pay only the cost of work actually done plus a reasonable profit. So if you were expecting to perform for a couple years and make several million dollars and it gets cut off at two months, you're just going to get paid for the costs you incurred in those two months. And there's also the option of a no-cost termination where the government does not pay the contractor anything. And that typically occurs when a contract is terminated uh, very soon into performance. Uh, these are some of the common T for C provisions that come from the FAR. Uh, the main example we have here is the fixed price short term form which provides the contracting officer by written notice may terminate this contract in whole or in part when it is in the government's interest. If this contract is terminated, the rights, duties, and obligations of the parties, including compensation to the contractor, shall be in accordance with Part 49 of the Federal Acquisition Regulation in effect as the date of this contract. And then there are other similar provisions for long-form fixed price, cost reimbursement, services contracts, architect and engineering contracts, and research and development contracts. As I mentioned earlier, the government's ability to T4C uh, is broad. It's in the government's interest. So it's often used when the agency's needs or the scope of work have changed and the government needs a way out of the contract. Uh, if you're interested, the T4C originated back in the Civil War era when the, gov when the war was ending and the government needed a way to quickly get out of contracts. This provided an easy mechanism for that. But there are limits to when the government can T4C. It cannot T4C simply to get a better price or in bad faith, uh, for example, with the intent to injure the contractor. And it cannot be done in abuse of discretion. And if you are encountered with a wrongful T4C, that's treated as a breach and you can recover anticipated profits, which are normally not recoverable in a T4C. In the T4C process, you'll first get a notice of termination, usually from the contracting officer. And that written termination notice will state that the contract is being terminated for the convenience of the government. The effective date of the termination, you may be asked to perform for a few more weeks or so, or a couple of days. The extent of the termination, because it could be the whole contract or just part of the contract, any special instructions that the government wants you to follow, and the steps to take to minimize the impact of personnel. Immediately, you should stop work on the terminated portions of the contract, terminate all subcontracts, and alert the CEO if you're unable to cease work. For example, if it's a construction contract and if you immediately stopped, you would leave hazardous conditions or potentially uh, cause additional costs. You'd want to let the CEO know, CEO know that you shouldn't cease work immediately. Then uh, longer term, you should notify the government in writing of any legal proceedings related to the subcontracts or other commitments, settle outstanding liabilities related to the contract, Prepare your settlement proposal, which we'll discuss in future slides down the road. Uh, settle with subcontractors and keep the lines of communication open with the government. The next big step in the T4C process is to submit your settlement proposal to the government. It's due no later than one year after contract termination, and you want to make sure to provide as much support for the cost you're claiming as possible. You'll want, you might need to negotiate after submitting that settlement proposal, or the government may just accept it and agree to pay you what you're claiming. If you need to negotiate, you should remember to be flexible and reach out to allies within the agency who may be able to help you with the negotiations. 
Once you've reached an agreement, you'll execute a settlement agreement, which is sometimes documented as a modification. I'll just add on this that, you know, Michelle's absolutely right that you have 12 months or a year after contract termination to submit the T4C settlement proposal. But, you know, we see a lot of agencies that want to get your proposal almost instantaneous and sometimes even before they issue the termination. Uh, they want to know, because they've decided to go in a different direction, what kind of costs, essentially, are they going to have to cover to get out of their contract with you? And, and Michelle will talk in a moment about the particulars for the termination for convenience settlement proposal. But I just want everybody to understand that you, know, you can push back on that. I mean, it, it makes sense the government wants to at least have an idea of what the potential costs are going to be associated with terminating your contract, but they, they cannot require you to, to have a completed settlement proposal instantaneous with the termination or even, you know, something short of one year after the termination. Because if you've got subcontractors and you have other, um, you know, uh, arrangements that you have to unwind as a result of the termination, you, you're not going to know the full extent potentially uh, of the costs for a, a little while after the termination. And they shouldn't put you in a position of having to know and have that all ironed out immediately. So and if, you have a, if you have a prime contractor who's just received uh, the T4C notice, you want to make sure before you've gotten in that situation that you have flowed down the T4C provisions in your subcontracts. The FAR will not protect the prime if it omits the T4C provision. So you could end up in a situation where your prime contract is terminated, but your subcontractor is still expected to, expecting you to allow it to perform and get paid. So that's why those provisions need to be flowed down. Then you'll terminate subcontractors immediately when you receive the T4C notice and request settlement proposals from your subcontractors. Yeah, we got a question here about uh, if you terminate, if a prime terminates a subcontractor for convenience, what costs can the subcontractor claim? Uh, that's going to be driven by, primarily by the agreement between the parties. Well, what does the subcontract entitle the subcontractor to in the event of that type of a termination? So if it's not something that you have addressed in your standard subcontract, it's something you should consider adding to your subcontract so that the parties are clear about what the sub will or will not be entitled to in the event of a termination. And if you're the subcontractor, you'll want to flow those T4C provisions down to your lower tier subcontractors for the same reason the prime is flowing the provisions down to you. You'll also want to cease work immediately upon receiving your T4C notice, terminate any lower tier subcontractors immediately, and make sure to track and document your costs so that when you submit your settlement proposal to the prime, you can recover as much as possible. So for a fixed price contract that's T for C, the, the preferred method to prepare your settlement proposal is the inventory basis. In the inventory basis, you itemize your costs separately. So you would have one line item for labor, one line item for materials, uh, one for overhead that you could directly allocate to this contract. And there's a standard form, which is easy to find online. It's standard form 1435, which provides blanks for you to fill in that information. If for some reason you cannot use the inventory basis or it will unduly delay your settlement proposal, you can use the total cost basis. It'll use the same types of costs, but they're not allocated the same way. Uh, instead of itemizing them out separately, it's you... you record them as you're able to record them. The CO must approve your using the total cost basis in advance and standard form 1436 uh, is the form to use for that approach. You'll use your actual cost incurred and a reasonable profit on those actual costs and then you'll set off the government's costs. I just wanted to jump in. It's a little bit of a tangent from where we are right now with the settlement proposal, but going back to 
the uh, T for C flowing down the T for C rights first from the prime to the sub and then from the sub to lower tier subs. We got a good comment here from one of the attendees about how they're experiencing subcontractors really push back and are not willing to sign a subcontract that includes a T for C clause. I think it's it's definitely not uncommon in my experience that that subcontractors balk at a T for C clause. And if I was representing a sub, I would too. I think though that what's reasonable is a limited T for C clause that would um, flow, flow down a termination that is commensurate with whatever termination the government might impose on the prime. So I think what, what subcontractors typically balk at is the blanket termination for convenience by the prime irrespective of what the government has done. So, you know, the prime can give you the boot whenever they want. Interest. Right, right. But if the government, so that doesn't surprise me when the sub doesn't accept that. But I think what you could, a, a fallback when you're negotiating that would be, we at least need to have a termination for convenience provision that says, in the event the government terminates my contract for convenience, then I have the right to turn around and terminate you for convenience. And I, I don't think there's a reasonable position for a subcontractor to not accept that as a middle ground. And I see we got a question of what is meant by set off the government's costs. That means if you owed money to the government for some reason under the contract or there was some kind of equipment that you, government property, that would be deducted from the amount that you could claim. So just so it balances out the pluses and the minuses. So we are now on page 16, if you don't have access to uh, the, the PowerPoint as we do it, which is the cost reimbursement settlement proposal. This is slightly different uh, because when you're using a, co a cost reimbursement contract, you're invoicing the government regularly using vouchers. You can continue to use those vouchers for the next six months following termination if you would like to proceed that way. And then once all those costs are vouchered, you can prepare a settlement proposal for any other additional costs. And there's another standard form, 1437, for that proposal. Once again, you're going to seek your actual costs incurred, but because cost reimbursement contracts often have an award fee associated with them, you can claim part of that award fee. To determine how much of that award fee you're going to claim, you look at how your award fee is calculated under your contract. And typically, you also look at the percentage of the work you've completed, and that helps drive what percentage of the award fee you're going to get. And once again, you set off the government's costs. Now, in your settlement proposal, you're going to seek allowable costs. The, the FAR's driving principle here is to give contractors fair compensation for the work they've done. So we're going to look at your allowable costs incurred during contract performance and a reasonable profit on the work performed. You should uh, be able to, you might need to help support the reasonable profit you're claiming maybe with what's standard in the industry or what you've been able to get on other government contracts that were similar. Yeah, and we, you know, we've had, Michelle and I have worked on a few with very high rates of profit. Um, and, you know, it's unique it, it, for, for us, at least, it causes us to, you know, furrow our brow a little bit when we first see it. But the contractor is able to establish both through their own past uh, contracts and how they put this particular bid together and, you know, maybe industry standards that that's not an unreasonable rate of profit. And the, the case law supports that even a very high percentage, you know, we're talking like 20, 30, 40 percent maybe is potentially supportable if you've got the support. Another thing contractors should definitely keep in mind is that you can recover your reasonable settlement expenses, which includes attorney's fees which you submit, you know, are 
invoice is redacted and you're able to get compensation for the time that we put in and you're also able to get compensation for the time that you and your personnel put in to helping prepare your end of the settlement proposal. Yeah, and on, on that point, it's really important for your folks to track the time that they're spending. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be as detailed maybe as the time entries that Michelle and I have, you know, in a, in a law firm bill, but you, you should have some way that you're tracking dates and time and amount of time spent on what you did so that we, it can be rolled into the, the claim. And then, you know, you, you get assistance both in-house and also through counsel and, it, and the, it's not ultimately at a cost to you, it's recoverable. So, and then the next thing we have here is certain continuing post-termination costs. And uh, one of the attendees here has asked if retraining costs for employees is allowable. So the types of continuing post-termination costs that are recoverable are those that necessarily flow from the termination of the contract or that you're legally required to pay. So you may have severance agreements or there may be laws that require you to pay your employees severance. So those kinds of things would be allowable. Um, and if you have to keep employees on hold, those kinds of things. But retraining is probably not an allowable cost in most circumstances. And if you had leases that you had to break, those kinds that you had entered into for the contract, those would be a post-termination cost that you could include. So you cannot recover um, anticipated profits or common items that are reasonably usable on other work and uh, post-termination overhead. Now here are some T4C best practices on page 18. Uh, what, big uh, tip from us is to engage your counsel early. They may be able to help identify costs that you wouldn't think of to recover and help you set up ways to track your costs and potentially even identify a bad faith argument and be able to get your anticipated profits. Uh, next thing is to keep records. You want to, as John said, keep track of your time spent preparing the settlement proposal, your time negotiating with subcontractors, your time talking to the contracting officer, any costs you're incurring because of the termination and costs incurred performing pre-termination. Communicating is key here. You want to uh, keep your subcontractors and your suppliers informed about what's going on and notify them immediately. That help you limit your costs down the road and alert the government to any issues or ongoing expenses. You don't want to surprise the government at the last minute when you submit your settlement proposal. And then to mitigate your damages, because if you allow subcontractors to keep performing or you incur additional costs that could have been mitigated, the government will not be likely to help you pay for those things. All right, so I'm going to jump into termination for default now, T for D. Um, you know, like its name suggests, this is not a termination based on the interests of the government, you know, some might say the whim of the government. This is a termination based on cause. The contractor did something or didn't do something they were supposed to do and didn't live up to their obligations under the contract. So uh, that's the basics of a T for D. Uh, it's supposed to be an extreme remedy used only when it's in the government's best interest. And we're going to come back to that point a few times as we move through the T for D section, but it's important to state at the outset that the, a T for D doesn't happen every day, isn't supposed to happen in, in most circumstances. It's, it's an extreme situation. And it's very bad for the contractor. It's an extreme remedy and it's an extreme uh, bummer for the contractor because it, it is a stain on your record. It's a, it's going to go in your CPARs and uh, PPIRS, PIPRs. Uh, so it, it's it, it's not a good thing. It's that's why we say you want to avoid it at all costs. And and we're going to give you some tools to uh, consider when if and when you may be faced with a T for D. Uh, now I'm moving to slide 21, um, and we're talking about what can lead to a T for D. 
So, I mean, these would be, you know, ways in which you could fall down in your performance of the contract, you know, failing to perform or deliver on time. And for this type of a failure, the government doesn't necessarily have to give you a notice or an opportunity to cure. You just, you missed the, the delivery date. Uh, you can be terminated for default. Failure to make progress, which endangers contract performance. This is the type of deficiency for which you should be given an opportunity to cure. The FAR uh, generally calls for a 10-day cure period, although for construction projects, if, if there's not enough time, um, for construction projects, or if there's not enough time, I should say, they don't necessarily have to give you an opportunity to cure, so they could go straight to the termination for default. Um, and in this type of a circumstance, failure to make progress, if that's caused by your subcontractor, so you were unable to make progress because of your subcontractor, that could be on you as the prime contractor. Um, unless it was beyond your control and there was no other means to obtain whatever it was that subcontractor was providing. Um, and then any other failure to perform in accordance with the provision of the contract could be a basis for a termination for default. That includes incorporated FAR clauses. And I mentioned a couple of labor-oriented FAR clauses here, Service Contract Act and Davis-Bacon Act requirements. You know, I, I don't think that it's typical that the government will move to T for D a contract based on failure to comply with Service Contract Act requirements, but it's possible. And we're seeing, and many of you may be experiencing, a lot more Department of Labor audits in this area. And generally, the Department of Labor, they, they just want the back wages paid. They're not as interested in pushing for a T for D. But I think, the, you know, the at the end of the road if the back wages weren't paid or you didn't reach an agreement with the DOL there, they could make a recommendation on, on a T for D. So that that's just one example of how failure to comply with an incorporated FAR clause could result in a T for D. Uh, now turning to slide 22, uh, what else can lead to a T for D? Anticipatory breach can lead to a T for D. And this is something that may not be intuitive for a lot of, of you, you know, that you haven't failed to perform at this point, but you're signaling to the government you might not perform in the future. And if you do that, the government can actually T for D you and claim that you anticipatorily breached the contract. I, I think the, the classic situation here is where um, maybe you're unhappy with something that the government is doing, and so you threaten to walk off the project. I'm going to take my tools and go home. That can be viewed as an anticipatory breach on your part. So it's whenever there are discuss, you know, it looks like a situation may be going in the direction of a termination. It's a good idea to bring your counsel in at that point because the way that you message uh, your side of the story and what you think should happen next is really important because even the words that your choice of words could potentially uh, lead you to an anticipatory breach, uh, take you from maybe being in a position of leverage in a situation to being um, in a bad spot where you know now you're you're having to to contest a termination for default. So uh, be careful about that. Just be aware of that, that, that you can, even if you haven't actually done anything wrong yet, uh, you could breach the contract simply by indicating you may not perform in the future. Um, other factors that can contribute to a T for D, I mean, these are basic, you know, I always like to say sort of forehead slapper type issues, you know, communicate well and be responsive, you know, relationships, uh, and the adequacy of your response to government requests for additional information or corrections, you know, those types of things, all of that really rolls up into uh, you know, how well of a job you're doing and keeping your customer happy. And those are the types of things that um, even the small communication or relationship issues can mushroom into a situation where you're facing a T for D. And that's, that's when it does get really serious. So minding all of these 
smaller but but nevertheless important things along the way can can be a a big help to avoiding a T for D situation. And as I've said a couple times, you know, it, it's a really serious situation if if you find yourself uh, with, with a T for D or a threatened T for D, and that there are financial ramifications of that because the government will they can complete the work and they can charge you for it. So whatever you weren't able to get done, they can go out and get it done. And if it costs them more to get it done, they can charge you those excess re-procurement costs. There also might be liquidated damages provisions in your contract or other potential damages that the government could recover. They, they may be able to go after administrative costs that they face and in having to clean up uh, your mess, so to speak. So there, there, there's definite financial ramifications that make this very different from a T for C. As Michelle outlined, you know, T for C, you're getting to submit a proposal to the government um, where they can, uh, they'll, they'll pay you for uh, various costs associated with the termination. And when you're in a T for D situation, uh, you know, it's a different ball game. And it's also beyond the financial ramifications, it's a black mark on your performance record. Like I mentioned, this is going to go in CPARs and, and PIPRs. So it's going to have a real impact on you in future procurements when contracting officers go to assess your past performance. Uh, it could also potentially affect you on commercial transactions and with banks, et cetera, if you have to make a disclosure that you've been uh, previously terminated for default on a contract. So uh, a lot of reasons to try to avoid it. Um, so how, how can we avoid it? Let's give some tips or talk about ways you might be able to mitigate T for D situations. So um, one of the biggies is that if you, if you have been given a cure notice or a show cause notice, cure notice being, you know, hey, you've got, we think you're falling down in these areas, you've got 10 days to cure, show cause notice, pretty similar, maybe show cause why you should not be terminated for default. Um, you really need to knock that out of the park. Um, so, you know, the basics, the, the, the blocking and tackling are really critical here. You know, respond on time. Give the government everything they've asked for. Um, address all of the issues that they're citing. You know, don't don't leave stones unturned. Um, and I I am really big on the tone that you take with these submissions. That I it, and it's it's a delicate approach because oftentimes you're going to get this cure notice and you're not going to agree with it and and you're going to think that maybe the government is the one more more responsible for the situation you find yourselves in as opposed to you. But you don't want the whole response to read defensively and like it's your fault, not ours, because that's not going to send the right message. At the same time, you, sh you don't have to fall on your sword over issues that are beyond your control. In fact, a big part of a successful response is to demonstrate what is beyond your control that's impacting your ability to perform. So, I mean, what you want to build to ultimately is this, uh, you know, that what's the path forward? What's the mutually beneficial way that we can work together to accomplish the government's mission? Um, and, you know, you do that by accepting responsibility, but at the same time, push back where, where you can and show them that, you know, this isn't all within your control or all, all your fault. I mean, to, to go back to the first slide on, on T for D, you know, this is an extreme remedy. It's it's going to be difficult for the government to go through a T for D too to start over. So if if we can demonstrate to them through the response to the cure notice that it's not in their best interest to do this, and here's why, um, even if it's you know sort of the devil you know uh, type response, I you know that that can go a long way towards avoiding the T for D. Um, some more tips here. You know, the, the just know that the government can withdraw or modify a termination notice. I mean, even a termination for convenience notice. I mean, I, I I've seen it where that's been suggested, and then the government asks, well, why don't you propose on a slightly different scope of work, and we'll see if we can figure something out. I mean, that you know, they don't 
necessarily have to stick with whatever approach they've sketched out in their notice. So you know, keep that in mind. They, they can withdraw or modify it. They can also convert a T for D to a T for C. And that can be negotiated with the contracting officer. It can also be submitted as a claim to the contracting officer. And ultimately then you, know, you can appeal the claim. You can, you can litigate over whether it should have been a T for C rather than a T for D. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a really important um, tool to use. And you don't have to just settle for uh, a, a T for D. It may be you can suggest a fallback. So, you know, then that's part of what we're saying here in the last bullet and we're on on uh, slide 25 that there are other alternatives to a T for D. You, know, you can finish out the current contract period and maybe don't exercise any more options. You know, and th this I've I've used this to with with success particularly when you're getting close to the end of the current contract year. You know, you don't need to T for D us. You can just not exercise the option. And then we don't have the T for D on our record. And they can, you know, maybe they just use the holdover clause to keep you doing the work for a few more months while they figure out their plan B strategy. Um, you know, they can do a partial termination and cut out a portion of the contract and let you finish the rest. Um, you know, obviously you can demonstrate how you're not in default and, and maybe get them to walk back from going in that direction. Um, but the, it, you know, if you get them to convert a T for D to a T for C, then you have all of the rights that Michelle discussed in her section uh, in a T for C. You know, you would do a T for C settlement proposal, et cetera. So um, that's, uh, that's definitely a, a, a good tool and we've used that successfully many times. On construction contracts, you want to make sure you promptly notify the government of delays. The, the FAR uh, termination provision for construction contracts says that you have to give them written notice uh, within 10 days of when the delay starts. And if you do that, then you may get the government will decide whether they will give you an extension of time to perform based on the delay. And if you don't agree with the government's ultimate decision there, that, that's an appealable issue. Uh, and, and the types of excusable delays that you may face that you uh, could cite to the government in the event they're threatening a T for D include uh, default of a subcontractor that's beyond your control or some other contractor did something on a on a job site that affects your ability to perform you know, beyond your control. Obviously things like changes in scope and defective specifications or even payment delays you know, are, are, are potentially excusable delays that you want to bring to the government's attention uh, to try to avoid a, a T for D. The, the next slide, slide 27, um, talks about whether or not the government properly notified you of the, the termination. You know, the, the, they've, they've got to check off some boxes in, the, in, in notifying you when they want to do a T for D. And depending on the circumstances, they may need to give you an opportunity to cure, uh, notify you that a T for D was imminent. The letter to you, that act, the actual termination letter, should give you details about what you did. Why, why are you in default? And you know, arguably, should reference relevant contract terms that are that you've arguably failed to live up to. And then it should the the, the termination should be designated as a final decision, and it should specify that you have appeal rights and what those appeal rights are. And when we get to the point of talking about some of the recent cases, we'll we'll talk about how um, in, in one case the the Board of Contract Appeals criticized the termination notice because it didn't give the contractor notification of its appeal rights. And so that was part of the reason the board uh, converted the T for D to a T for C. So the government's got to jump through these hoops when they terminate you and make sure they did. Uh, I think we, we have a lot of small business contractors on the the presentation. So I have a couple slides here on T4D issues specific to small businesses. Um, you know, there are some additional steps that the government is supposed to follow when they terminate 
a uh, small business contract so that they're supposed to provide a copy of a cure notice or a show cause letter to the contracting officers, uh, small business specialists, as well as the nearest SBA regional office. Uh, and they're supposed to consult with the small business specialist before proceeding with the T4D on a small business contract. So you know, our, I don't know how often that's actually followed on, on set-aside contracts. I, I think that's an important point to make to the contracting folks. If you're on a small business contract, you know, have they taken these extra steps? And then use your your uh, OSDEBU representative at whatever agency you're contracting with, as well as SBA representatives for assistance. You know, they, they can act as intermediaries for you if you're trying to smooth out a performance issue and try to keep the contract. Um, so you want to use these types of things to your advantage. And when I say in the last bullet here on slide 28, uh, use your small business status to your advantage in negotiations. Again, I just I want to reiterate that a T for D is supposed to be an extreme remedy, and the repercussions of a T for D will be particularly harsh for a small business. Um, and may be their only contract, you know, their their primary or only source of revenue. Um, and it'll be a lot harder to overcome the reputational damage of a T for D for a, a small business as opposed to a very large contractor. So uh, you, know, you play up those those angles if you're a small business and, and you might be facing a T for D. Um, also, if you're a small business, you're potentially subject to SBA protests, like a size protest or a hub zone or a service disabled vet or woman owned eligibility protest. And if you lose that protest, so you're found to be ineligible for the contract, what happens if you've already been awarded the contract? You know, the agency is supposed to do a notice, of, a, a pre award notice, the notice of apparently successful offeror which allows the filing of an SBA protest and the resolution of the SBA protest before the contract is actually awarded. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. A lot of times they just go right to making the award. And then if this SBA grants the protest and you're found to be ineligible, the agency has to terminate your contract. And I think in the vast majority of cases, the agency is going to terminate the contract for convenience. It may be a no-cost termination because maybe you never even started doing any work. Um, or if it's if a no-cost isn't appropriate, it would at least be a, a termination for convenience. But we had a case earlier this year where the agency terminated the contractor for default. And this went on to their past performance record, and it was because they had lost a size protest. And you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that that's not going to become a growing concern. I don't know how many folks on the webinar have experienced that themselves. It was the first time anybody in our office had seen a, a T for D as a result of an SBA protest decision. And I think we were successful in getting it turned around uh, so that it, it is going to be converted to a T for C. But And so what I've listed here are some pushback points I think you could use if, if this ever happens. So again, hopefully this, this is a, a pretty you know narrow or niche circumstance that won't affect most of you, but I, I point it out because it, uh, it's an interesting use of, of the T for D in the small business context. Uh, so, okay, quickly now, uh, we're on slide 30, and we're, we've, uh, we're just going to do a quick wrap-up of uh, T for C versus T for D, uh, causes, costs, and effect on past performance, you know, three big areas where T for C and T for D are different. So this, you know, just uh, if you can answer these yourselves, it shows how well you've been paying attention so far and how awake everybody still is. So. Uh, T for C, you know, no cause is required, but generally a change in the government's needs results in the T for C. Big difference, the T for D is based on cause. You know, you did you did something or you failed to do something that that didn't comply with the contract. Big difference on cost too. T for C, you know, the contractor is usually able to recover costs incurred and reasonable profit. 
Uh, whereas in a T4D, you may be liable to the government for various costs, including excess reprocurement costs. An effect on past performance should be a big difference too. Should be no impact on past performance for T4C versus T4D, there's an obvious impact on past performance. Uh, however, we have experienced from time to time some contracting officers that that seem to question a T for C as there's some adverse connotation with a T for C. You know that that really shouldn't happen. But if you if that's been your experience, so we'd like to hear from you, and and uh, you can do some pushback on that too, because the the T for C really, I mean, it's it's for the government's convenience. It, it may be used because they're not happy with how the contract's going, but um, it. It's not in and of itself an indication that you performed badly. And now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to talk about appeals. So uh, you can appeal a termination. Uh, if you've got a default termination, you, you may want to appeal that, as John mentioned. Um, and you could even appeal aspects of your termination for convenience, which we'll cover now. Uh, so when you are signing your settlement agreement or a modification when, you're, when the contract is terminated, you want to watch out for any waiver language before you sign that document. It may have uh, some language limiting your cost or saying, you know, this concludes your rights, there, you know, our obligations are over, you don't, you don't get anything else. You don't want to sign that if you have not had an opportunity to prepare and submit your settlement proposal and make sure that you're getting the cost back that you were expecting to. When you submit your settlement proposal, it's possible that the contracting officer will deny it or even fail to issue a decision on it and give you a deemed denial. In either case, you could appeal that decision uh, to the board or to the Court of Federal Claims. And if you want more information on that, you can on the choice of forms and other claims issues, you can refer to our recent webinar, and the link is right there. And as John said, you can appeal the issuance of a T for D and get that converted to a T for C. Mm -hmm. Now, Environmental Safety Consultants is a recent decision from the Armed Service Board of Contract Appeals, and it's a good example of why it's important to support your claimed costs. In this case, uh, the contractor had a contract to remove and install fuel storage tanks. The contract was T for D, and the contractor successfully got that T for D converted to a T for C. It was then given the opportunity to submit its settlement proposal, and the CO refused to negotiate or issue a final decision. When the contractor went to the ASBCA, the ASBCA denied the appeal because the contractor failed to support its claims costs. For example, it submitted gross payroll records to support its direct labor costs. Instead of having, you know, itemized this employee did this many hours doing this kind of work, as John said, would be helpful in a proposal. And it did not provide a general corporate ledger to support its direct costs uh, and did not break it down. And then for the claimed expenses related to vendors and subcontractors, ESCI, the contractor here, did not provide any invoices. They just provided the checks that they had submitted. And it's important to note that here, the ASBCA gave ESCI the option to amend its settlement proposal and told uh, the contractor the problems with its proposal, but the company still did not include the required support and they were not able to recover the costs they were claiming. Xerox Corp is another recent decision. It's a somewhat unique case uh, because Xerox had a schedule contract to lease Xerox copiers and other similar equipment to the government. And under the contract, the government had the right to terminate for convenience, but it also provided that Xerox would receive early termination charges if the agency decided to terminate a uh, delivery order for reasons other than the lack of a bona fide need for the equipment or functionally similar equipment or appropriated funds sufficient to make the lease payments. Well, here the Navy terminated a delivery order early and refused to pay the early termination charges. The Navy claimed that it had replaced the equipment with newer equipment, but it was uh, not able to support that, that claim at the, AS, at the CBCA here. Um, so Xerox submitted a certified claim 
and the CO issued to fail a decision. At the CBCA, the, the issues were pretty clear for the board because the contract specifically provided that Xerox would be able to get early termination charges if the agency was not able to satisfy either of these two conditions. And here, the agency was not able to satisfy those conditions, so the CBCA granted uh, Xerox's appeal and ordered the Navy to pay the charges plus interest. I think John's going to go over another recent decision. Yeah, we're in the home stretch now, everybody. We're uh, clicking over to slide 34 if you're following along at home. This is the CP of Bozeman case just from last month. And we wanted to highlight this one because it's an example of a conversion of a T for D to a T for C, just so you can see, you know, real world. What do we, how, how does this work? So in this case, CP of Bozeman, they had some, uh, they, they were operating some concessions on an Air Force base, and the contract had some unique provisions in it, including a provision that gave either party the right to terminate on one day's notice. Um, so that, that, that's not a typical contract provision with the government, but it was in this particular contract. Well, the government gave, uh, at the time the, the solicitation came out, the contractor, CP of Bozeman, asked for information about the monthly uh, costs and revenues for these two concession stands. And the, the contractor made some critical um, bad assumptions or analysis of the financial information. And so the way that the contractor bid the contract, they were losing money on both of these concession stands. And you know, there, there was a series of, of negotiations with the government where they were saying, you know, the contractor kept saying, look, we're losing money. We need to change things here. And ultimately, they weren't, they, they weren't able to make any uh, sufficient changes. And so the contractor sent a letter to the government saying, this is our last day operating these concession, this particular concession stand is going to be closed on Monday. And they went ahead and started getting their inventory out of there. Well, as a result of that, the government claimed that the contractor was in breach and terminated the contractor for default. And the, the case ended up going before the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals. The contractor tried to recover the losses that they had incurred, uh, you know, based on the uh, financial information they were given with the solicitation and the contractor tried to convert the T4D to a T4C. The Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals, they rejected the claim for the losses because they said, contractor, that's on you. you. You misinterpreted the financial data that the government gave you. Uh, but with respect to the T4D, the board said, it, this should not have been a T4D because the contractor was simply exercising its right under the contract to say, we're, we're gone on Monday. Uh, so the, the, they were successful in getting the T for D converted to a T for C. Um, you know, that may not be, uh, you know, the, the most typical case because most cases aren't going to have uh, that type of uh, termination right for the contractor, but it gives you an idea. And in fact, the letter that the contractor sent in other circumstances would be the anticipatory breach potentially that we talked about earlier. You know, you need, you need to be careful of saying, look, I, I'm... I'm not happy with the way things are going, so I'm out of here. Uh, but in this particular case, because of what the contract allowed for, that was permissible. Uh, and it, it should not have been a T for D, so it was converted to a T for C. Looks like we have a few minutes left, um, and we, we have some questions here. We've answered several. Um, I'll see if we can pick through a few. And, and please keep sending them in if you have any. Um, have we? Have you ever seen the government go after re-procurement costs? Yeah, I have actually. We we had a T for D case a few years ago where um, with the Coast Guard for some items that ended up being defective, and the government was claiming it, it was in the millions of dollars worth of what it was going to cost for them to go out and get these items through a different source at that point. Uh, we were successful in that case in negotiating a resolution with 
the government. Our, our client still had to pay some money. Not I don't know that it was necessarily associated with uh, re-procurement costs, though, but they withdrew the T for D and converted it to a T for C because we were able to, to demonstrate through negotiations that there were uh, reasons beyond our control that led to uh, the issues with the item. So, you know, we didn't have to file a claim. We threatened filing a claim, but we were able to keep it at a negotiation level, and that, that worked pretty well. So we were able to, to back them off of the vast majority of what they were seeking um, in that case. Um, somebody else here has asked, does a contractor have the right not to continue an option year? Um, and I think the idea behind this question is, you know, if you're not happy with how a contract is going, can you uh, decline the option? In most cases, no. The option is, is the government's option. So they're the ones, it's a unilateral right on the part of the government to exercise it. Um, so I do think, depending on your contract, you want to be careful about anticipatory breach, what we talked about in, in, in suggesting you know, you don't want the contract after the option year. But, you know, the reality is that if if there's problems on the contract, you should be talking to your customer about them. And you don't have to do it in a way that would signal anticipatory breach, but you do it in a way that lets them know the real challenges that you're facing and that maybe it'd be better for everybody if the option isn't exercised. And I've definitely been in, in discussions and letters, meetings, et cetera, where we have talked about not exercising an option as being maybe the best resolution for everybody. So you, you, depending on your contract, you probably don't have the affirmative right to decline an option. But, you know, it depends on your contract. But in most cases, you probably can't decline it, but you can at least put that on the table and discuss uh, with the government. Oh, so the, we have one question here of please define the ASBCA and the CBCA. The ASBCA is the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals. That board hears uh, decision, hears case, appeals um, for a DOD entities typically, and also the Army Corps of Engineers. I believe NASA also goes to the ASBCA. It's an it's an administrative tribunal, uh, so it's a little bit more informal and usually hopefully faster than a court and more cost effective. The CBCA is the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals, so that here is HUD, uh, GSA, HHS, those kinds of contracts. I think I'll take one more, and then we'll, we'll probably be about out of time. The uh, Have we ever seen the government fail to terminate and simply stop work to avoid a T for C settlement? I, I don't think the government could, could avoid a T for C settlement simply by stopping work. I mean, they could issue a stop work order, and that, but you would have rights to costs associated with the stop work order. And that goes back to our, our part one of this webinar series. We talked about REAs and claims in part related to stop work orders. You, you may be asking if you've seen the government instead of T for D switch to a T for C. And one of the first cases I worked on at Palermo Maza was the contractor was talking to the government. The government was threatening a T for D. And we were able to negotiate with the government and say, hey, let's do a no-cost T4C here instead. And that ended the problem for both parties. And each side was able to walk away with its needs met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, a no-cost termination is something that's also you know, thrown out a, a fair amount as a, as a middle ground. You know, maybe the contractor has some costs, but they're willing to give up those costs in exchange for getting out of the contract. And this goes back to the question somebody asked earlier that, that we answered about, you know, declining an option. You know, offering a no-cost termination can, particularly when you actually have costs you could claim, you know, you're showing the government we'd be willing to give something up here in order to get out if you think that's what, what you've got to do. So. Um, we're going to end there. There are a few questions we didn't get to. I promise everybody who, who asked questions, we will email you within the next day or so to make sure we answer your questions. Really appreciate everybody's time today. Thanks for 
joining us. Uh, please check out part one on our website, and, and these will be up on the website uh, with the audio either later today or tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.